Alrighty, everybody ready? So, um, I didn't get time to do the nice uh, sprite animation example that I hope to do today, okay? But I'll do it for next week. Uh, there's loads of example code on the net, but I want to find one that's really simple. And I want to kind of mostly code it myself, so I'm very clear about how it works. A um, couple of other things. Uh, next Monday, I'm going to give you your assignment. I've been racking my brains trying to come up with something interesting. You'll be interested to learn that guess what? It's not an actual game. But you do it in X and A, all right? It's a computer science problem. And having said that, if anybody is doing the Imagine Cup game design competition, which I'll be making an announcement about at State of Play on Friday, who's going to State of Play? Cool, all right. So if you're not going to State of Play, it'll be streamed live on the internet. So you should consider watching it because there's lots of people of your own peer group, you know, including um, Shane and uh jason where is he here he's not here okay so shane and jason will be actually demoing at state of play on friday and you know similar sort of peer groups to yourselves will be showing off their studios and showing off their games and what they're working on in computer science artists musicians programmers all working together to make interesting and cool things so um yeah so they'll be making an announcement but if you're doing the imagine cup game design competition you are exempt from this assignment you, i'm not expecting you to demo this assignment instead you have your Imagine Cup deadline, which is the 31st of January, and that's what you're aiming towards instead of, so you can forget about this assignment that I have to give out. So in other words, if you want to form a team and make something as a team to do a competition with, you don't have to do this assignment. Is that clear to everybody? And I'll give you a grade for your work on whatever it is you're doing uh, as an outside thing instead. But I think the assignment that I've come up with is really cool and interesting. And I think, uh, again, you won't have a, you know, you'll need to program. Definitely, if you can't program, you won't have a hope of doing this assignment. It's a programming one. And as far as I know, I can't find any example. That's probably out there. I, I, I think there's loads of examples in Java and loads of examples in other languages. The other thing that I'm going to insist that everybody does, just to make sure that there's, um, you know, that you write all of this yourself. I much prefer if you hack away at it and don't get anything achieved and demonstrate stuff that you've actually done yourself rather than find something on the net and try and sort of customize it a little bit and submit it that's completely unacceptable so i need everybody to fill out a document which i'll give you a template for next week explaining you know every single class in your project where it came from in other words if it's something you got from a tutorial then you need to be honest about that and say it and then what percentage of that class file you specifically wrote yourself all right but I'll, I'll give you all of this next week anyway it's a very cool and exciting assignment and i've been wanting to do it for years but i never thought people were you know, ready for it, but I, I think you guys are ready for it. It's going to be great. So, anyway, because we're not doing sprite animation today, this is what you're doing in the lab, by the way. You're making a second tank. So we did one tank which is controllable using the keyboard. You guys are making another tank in the lab this week, which is just going to go around like that. And when it reaches the corners of the screen, it changes direction and moves around. So that's what you're working on the lab this week, just in case. So you know exactly, you know, when you see the lab, that's, that's what it is you're trying to achieve. Does that sound okay? <laughs> cool. Do your best, anyway. All right. So there's one other thing which is kind of important in this sort of framework that we're building towards. And that's the idea of being able to make use of polymorphism in a practical way in our, um, in our projects. So today I'm going to talk about that. And in order to do this little polymorphism thing... We'll move this tank example along, along a little bit and we'll make it possible for the player control tank to fire bullets at the other tank. And then what we'll need to do then is because we've got basically two tanks and we'll have loads of things, loads of bullets, potentially hundreds of them on the screen at the same time. And we need to keep track of them all in a practical way. And we'll see that what we have on the screen now is three different types of objects, three different classes, if you like. We'll have an AI tank which is the guy that's driving around the outside. We'll have a player control tank and we'll have a bullet. And they're all examples of game entities with different update methods. So that's an example of uh, overriding the update method. They're all drawing in pretty much the same way, but the update method for all of them is different. And we'll see a practical way of trying to minimize the amount of code that's required to do that. So here's what we'll do first of all. Right, first of all, let's make a bullet class. All right. 
So I'm going to click on my project here, click add new item, and I'm going to call this class bullet. That's okay, there we go. So just to complete the code that Visual Studio gives us, I'm going to make that public. E-V-L-I-C, class bullet, and I'm going to make this one extend game entity as well. And I'm also going to just copy the headers from these other classes, you know, these using things. I'm going to copy this into bullet.cs and paste it in there. So now, ah, oh, this is a Windows, not a Mac, so it's Control C and Control V. So we'll paste it in there. So now I have a bullet class and bullet extends game entity. The bullet extends game entity. Will this program compile at this point? No. Why not? Because uh, you haven't implemented the abstract. Exactly, because game entity has abstract methods in it. I haven't implemented them. So, you know, you can just try doing a build and you'll see that it'll give you the error to say that, um, yep, does not, in in you know, does not in implement inherited abstract member. So remember we, we said yesterday that that's one of the characteristics of an abstract class, mm. is that you have to now put in a load content, an update, and a draw method. Otherwise, it won't compile. That's what an abstract class uh, forces us to do. <coughs> so we'll put in the abstract methods here, public, Override and once you start typing override visual studio kicks in and it helps you and says look there are all these ones from the base class Which one do you want to override? So we'll over or override them all so we'll take our load content. We'll also take Override uh, void We'll take the uh, update and we'll take the draw as well So you see what Visual Studio is saying, look, when you type override, these are the only ones you can override. So we put in the draw as well. So there we go. So we've got, now it will compile, right? Because even though there's, there's no, nothing in these yet, it will now compile. Now what's that telling you? Yeah, okay. So if I save my project, that error will go away. So now the next thing I need to do is I need to add a sprite for that guy. All right, because I want to draw it using a little bullet sprite, which is just going to be a little circle. So if you remember, Anytime we want to add art assets to our project, we add them into the content project. Isn't that right? Not into the, the this bit of the project. It's this bit is where our classes go. This bit down here is where the art assets go. So we'll click add existing item. And I'll just find that in one of my other courses in my game engines course. There's tank game in here, tank game content. And there's my bullet sprite. You can see it's just a little you can see it's just a little square, okay? So I'm gonna click add for that guy. All right, now we'll build everything, make sure it's loaded, okay? So the first thing we want to do is in load content here, I want to load the sprite for the bullet. So sprite, where does sprite come from? It comes from game entity, it comes from the base class. You notice there's no game, there's no sprite in here and that's because it comes from game entity. That's what inherits means. It means it gets everything from the base class. So we want to use the, the same technique, this little trick that we have for getting access to the things in the game one instance. Uh, so we'll use the content in there, dot load, and it's a texture 2D, and then the file name is called bullet, and you don't put in the BMP extension. Alrighty, so now that's that. All right, so that's my bullet class. Okay, so let's have a look at game entity and see what we have here. We have this position vector and we have this look vector. And we did say previously, you know, when we were making the, uh, the tank class, what's the look vector when we did it yesterday? The way the tank is facing. Right, it's a vector which tells you the direction in which the tank is looking, okay? So, and we move in the direction of our look vector. So if our, vector, our look vector was zero and one, which direction would we be moving? Straight down. Straight down, okay. If, we were, if our look vector was minus one, zero, which way would we be moving? Some of the non-people who are demoing on Friday. Somebody else throw in. Left. We were moving to the left. Is that clear to everybody? 100% which way those go? Okay. So we move in the direction of our look vector and we, we pretty much, you know, when we want to add bullets to our scene, we'll, we'll, we'll evaluate or we'll set some look vector on the bullet. We'll get our look vector basically to move in the direction of our look vector. So, so the simple thing we have to just basically decide here, do we have speed somewhere in game entity? 
uh, I don't think there's a speed. All right, so we'll decide what, how speed, how fast our look vector is going, uh, or how fast our bullet is going. Let's pick um, speed equals to 200. So we want to move at 200 pixels every second. And then the other thing, of course, you need here is the time delta. Time delta equals game time <coughs> dot elapsed game time dot total seconds. And that's basically how you figure out how much time has elapsed since this method was last called. All right, so that gives you how much time has elapsed since the method was last called. Is that fair enough with everybody? So it's all stuff we've done before. And then I want to change the position so that it moves in the direction of the look vector uh, a certain number of units. And remember, this is like saying a car is traveling at five kilometers per hour and it travels for half an hour. It will have traveled how far? If it's traveling at five kilometers an hour for half an hour, it will have gone two and a half kilometers. And how did you work that out? You took the time multiplied by the speed and you added that then to the to the distance travel that's how you calculate the distance travel so that's the same thing we'll do here position plus equals to um the look vector because that's the direction which i'm looking multiplied by the time that i'm traveling for multiplied by the speed so that's going to move the bullet in the direction of the look <coughs> vector by a certain time amount and then in the draw down here, we'll draw the bullet. So to draw the bullet, we make use of the thing which we get from the uh, game one, which is called the sprite batch. Sprite batch dot draw. And we learned yesterday there's loads of versions of this one. This one we don't need to do any rotate. The bullet doesn't rotate, right? So we'll just draw it in at a position. So the first parameter it takes is the sprite, the, 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 the picture you want to draw. Second parameter, then we'll, we'll use this version of it, which just takes the position. And then the third one, color dot white. Uh, and there we go. So that's my bullet class, pretty much done. That's the bullet class, pretty much done, right? The bullet's just going to move in a particular direction and draw itself. And so the bullet is responsible for drawing itself, and the bullet is responsible for, for moving itself. Now, is that okay with everybody so far? Or is there anything there that you need me to explain before we move on? Is everyone okay with that so far? Just if there's anything at all there so far, just let me know if there's something that you're not 100% confident that you know exactly what it does and why it's there. Alrighty, we shall move on. Everyone happy? Good. Okay. Here's another trick, right? This is another magic spell, if you like. Um, over in game one, well, hang on, let me do one little small thing first. What fires the bullets in the game? The gun of the tank. The gun of the tank, right? So we're not making a separate class for the gun. So what's, what class is gonna make bullets? The tank, doesn't that make sense? The tank is the class which is responsible for creating bullets. All right, do you see how the OO thing is coming into consideration here? We're thinking about what happens in the real world and we're trying to model it in software. You know, you wouldn't say, for example, that the game makes the bullets or that the space makes the bullets or anything else. It's the tank is responsible for firing the bullets. The tank owns the bullets and it fires them. So let's do that first of all, okay? So let's pick our tank class here. And we'll have a look at the update method for the tank class. This is just the update method we wrote yesterday with the look x and y being calculated using the sine and the cosine, right? So let's say if we press the space key, I want to create a new bullet. If k state, which is just the keyboard state, dot is key down, keys dot space. If I press the space key, Let's create a new bullet. Bullet B equals new bullet. Now, a couple of things we need to do here. What's the bullet's position? What's the bullet's starting position? What's that? Position of the tank. I think that's a good one to use, right? 
E-dot position. Now we may change this around. We might decide to move it a little bit in front of the tank. But for now, let's start it off as the tank position. E-dot position equals my position. All right, so that's saying the position of the bullet is equals to the position of the tank because this is inside the tank class. You could equally write this dot position. Either one is fine, but because we're already inside the class, you don't need to use the this. What should the bullet's look vector be? Same as the tank's look vector, right? So if the tank is turned this way, I want the bullet to move in this direction. All right, so the tank's look vector, the bullet's look vector is going to be the same as the tank dot look, tank's look vector. Now, I need something to call update and draw on the bullet so that the tank draws itself and the tank updates itself. Oh, sorry, the bullet draws itself and the bullet updates itself. So where am I going to put that code, would you think? So I have an update and a draw method in the bullet, but I want to make sure that that gets called once per frame. And also, I'm going to create loads of bullets here. Every time I press the space, it's going to create a new bullet. So how are we going to handle this one? Well, first of all, let, let, let's consider the first, let's consider this as two problems. Number one problem we have is that this class is creating new instances of game entities and potentially going to create hundreds <coughs> of them. So if I'm creating multiples of the same thing in a programming language, where should we, what type of, what, what, what should we use to store them? Huh? An array. An array. Okay. So that's a good one, right? What we really want now is instead of just one bullet, we may want to have an array of bullets because we might have hundreds or thousands of them, right? So here's the little bit that we're going to move things forward today, okay? And I'm going to jump in here into game one because currently game one owns the tank and game one also, is this example, owns the AI tank, right? But what we want to do now is, you know, look at this. Tank is a game entity. AI tank is a game entity. Bullet is a game entity. Why don't I just make an array of game entities? And then they could be tanks or bullets or AI tanks. So the first thing is, right, an array. Limitations with an array. What's the limitation of an array in C or C sharp? That's, that's okay, because we can actually make them game entities. So they are actually the same type, right? But that's a very, very good observation. Um, but interestingly, that's not going to be a problem for us, because we just use the base class as the type of the array. And because we're using polymorphism, that's okay. They're all actually game entities because they all extend game entities. What's the other limitation of an array? Size. What's that? Size. The size. What's the, what's the thing about the size of an array? It's fixed. It's a fixed size, isn't it? You have to tell the array when you're creating it how many elements you're going to have in the array. Does everybody remember this from arrays last year? So you go, you know, um, int 10, and that creates 10. But our problem here is, like, we were going to start out basically with two in the array, and then we want to maybe add hundreds more bullets. So our array needs to grow and shrink. Now, we could just keep track and say, okay, we're going to have a maximum of 1,000 entries, and then just keep track of something which just keeps track of the last element. But there's a better way in C Sharp, right? Because this is such a common problem in programming, you know, this necessity for having arrays that will grow and shrink, there's actually a class built into C Sharp that will do that job for you. And, and, and this is actually in every OO language, there's something similar to this. In C++, there's a framework called the Standard Template Library, which is exactly the same. And I'm sure there's the same thing in Lua and Python and everything, definitely in Python. There are these data structures which can grow and shrink, right? Like a string, you can add stuff to the end of it. Well, actually, you can't. It's immutable. But in C Sharp, there is a class called a list. And, uh, sorry, game entity, like that. All right, so this is how you set a list up. I'm going to zoom right in on this, and I'll document this example and put it up on the website as well, okay? But basically, lists are really simple things. Um, you go list game entity, and that creates a list, like an array, but it's uh, now it's actually a list. And internally, this is implemented as, I don't know how it's implemented. It's some sort of list or linked list, possibly, doubly linked list. I don't know. And... Um, so I typically call this one children, because they're children of the game, if you like, even though that's not... There's a concept in games program called the scene graph, you know? So, um, but that's where this word children comes from. And, and why don't we 
maybe pick a better name for it. What's a better name for all the things we want to keep track of? How about just entities? Right. Yeah, that makes more sense. Right, so there's a game entity and they're called entities. And you just construct this, right? New list game entity like that. Now, you remember when we were doing our content.load, we came across these angle brackets. What do they mean? Without getting too complicated about it, because we'll do that in much more detail in the next semester. What does that angle bracket thing mean? I've mentioned it a couple of times. Anybody remember? It's a type, right? It's passing a type as a parameter. So maybe just write a note about that, okay? So if you come across that, and we'll spend a lot more time explaining how to code these examples up yourself, but this is passing a type as a parameter when you use these angle brackets here, okay? So this is making a list, and we're passing this type as a parameter to the list when we're, when we're making it. So now I have a list of entities. So now, in initialize here, I can go tank equals new tank, AI tank equals new AI tank, and then I call it entities. So C Sharp and Visual Studio being very handy and convenient for us. It tells us what you can do to this list of entities. So you can call entities.add. And that adds something to the end of it and increases the size by one. So you can go entities.add tank. Entities.add AI tank. All right, so now I've added these two things to the list of entities. And now down here, in my load content, instead of calling tank.load content and AI tank.load content, you can basically just write a for loop that goes through all the entities and just calls load content on them. And you end up with much less code by doing things like this. So you can go for int i equals zero, semicolon i is less than entities. And then you might wonder, how do you know how many elements are in it? Well, it's basically just a property of it. There you go, entities.count tells you how many entities are in that list, right? And then to get something out of it, same as with an array, you can go entities i, like that. As if it was an array, but it's not actually an array. But you're used to this, I guess, from first year, hopefully, this square bracket notation, yeah? Does everybody remember this from using arrays in first year? So that just gets the array at element number i. And then you can call load content here. And then down here, we can call load content. Uh, sorry, we can call update. Instead of calling tank update, AI tank update, you can call entities.update. Oh, yeah, we've got to pass in the game time, of course. And then down here, instead of calling tank.draw and AI tank.draw, we can call entities.draw. Now, all that remains, okay, is whenever we create a new bullet, we need to remember to add it to that list of entities. So let me jump down here to this entities thing here, and I'll make this private. And in order to allow us to get access to it outside, I'm going to refactor and click on encapsulate fields, which adds a property. All right, you remember what properties are? So that's gonna add a property, which just, um, and in fact, I'll make a set, a getter for it, I won't make a setter for it. So you can just go do dot entities with an uppercase E, and it gets access to that private one. Remember we did properties? Cool. So then the last thing then over here in my tank class, Whenever I add, the, whenever I create the new bullet, I just need to add it to the list of things that the game is keeping track of. So you can go game one dot instance dot entities dot add b. Now one thing we have to remember here is this AI tank thing here. In fact, you know what? Let me just run that as is. Okay. And there is one small bug here. I don't know if anyone has anyone spotted it. You have to load the texture. You have to load the texture, right? Because at this stage, this is in the update method. Load content is already called. All right. In game one, load content is already called, so it won't load the content. You have to actually have to manually load the content. So to do that, you just call <coughs> b dot load content. 
because it's too late you know the array load content from game one it's too late it's already caught this is the update method it's too late so there we go and then we hit f5 and watch this magically oh my goodness look at that <laughs> loads of bullets and they're okay they're coming from the center of the tank more or less aren't they yeah yeah, the center of the tank isn't probably exactly right, though. Sure, it's not? Not exactly. It's not a disaster. And also, we've way too many bullets now, don't we? And what would happen if I kept pressing space here forever? You know, I held on to it for maybe five, ten minutes. What would eventually happen? Why? I would use up all my RAM. Where are all those bullets gone? They're still there. They're still getting drawn. They're still getting updated. And that array is growing in size all the time. So there's loads of things we might like to do here, okay? We might like to, number one, when a bullet goes outside the bounds of the screen, we might want to remove it. We might want to delete it. Another thing that we might want to do is we might want to say only fire with, say, 10 per second or 5 per second. So have a fire rate. And then also we want to say when you're firing that bullet, instead of firing it from the center of the tank, fire it from a position slightly in front of the tank. So let's do those things. There's three things there. We'll see if we get them all done, right? Number one thing we want to do is we want to delete those bullets once they go outside the bounds of the screen. So what we need to do is we need to, first of all, figure out if the bullet has gone outside the bounds of the screen. How are we going to do that? We create a boundary. Like the screen would be the boundary, and then every time it hits the boundary, it takes away that bullet. From Perfect. That's exactly what we're going to do. Yeah. But the first question is, how do we know if it's gone outside the bounds? By its position. And what are you going to do to check? How do you check the position to see if it's gone outside the bounds? Check the coordinates of it. Check the co how do you check the coordinates? How do you check anything? Vector. In code, it's going to be an if statement. All right, an if statement. If the position x is greater than the width of the screen, or the position x is less than zero, or the position y is greater than the height of the screen, or less than zero, then that means it's it's safe to remove it because it's no longer needed so this is the way i like to do that the way i like to do that is in game entity i add another variable here i add another field called alive and then i like to make a constructor for this guy to set that sets that to be true initially So I set alive to be true, and uh, yeah, I'm going to make an accessor for that as well. Just a refactor, click on encapsulate field. <coughs> so now I have get and sets for that, and I get access to that via alive with an uppercase A, and then that's how I get access to that private variable, right? So then over here, where should I put that code for checking to see if the bullet's gone outside of the bounds of the screen? Bullet's update. Yeah. That's exactly where I would put it. I would make the bullet responsible for knowing itself whether it should be alive or not. So in the bullets update, there is a little thing here which you're going to do in the lab this week, but I, I included this in the, in the lab this week, right? It's just to get the bounds of the screen. To get the bounds of the screen in X and A, you use this object called the graphics device, right? So you call graphics device .viewport .height, and that gives you the height of the screen. And to get the width of the screen, you call graphics device .viewport .width. All right, so these are properties on the viewport, which is also a property of the graphics device object. All right, so, and I've made these, I've made accessors for these, just a public int width and a public int height. So that's something you're going to be doing in the lab. But basically, in bullet here, in update, I can basically say, if position.x is greater than... Here, let's just put a variable in here. Int with equals game one dot instance dot width and then int height equals game one dot instance dot height and then you go position dot x is greater than the width And we can do this all probably in one statement, right? If the position x is greater than the width, 
or position x is less than zero. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to everybody? So I'm checking to see if the width, if the x is greater than the width, you know, or if the x is less than zero, or if the position y is greater than the height, or the position y is less than zero, then what do I want to do? I want to set that alive variable to be equals to false. Okay, so that doesn't do anything. All it just says is, yeah, I'm now not alive anymore. So what I need to do now over here in game one is to look at my update method here, and then there's the update method there. All right, so I've updated the thing, and then what I need to do is if entities at position i dot alive equals false, I want to remove it. And this is how you remove something from a list. You just go entities dot remove. Entities at position i. There we go. That's number one problem solved. Does everybody follow what I just did there? Does anybody want to ask any questions about that before we go on and do the next bit? <coughs> you follow what I did? So each bullet then basically just checks its X and Y against the bounds of the screen. If it finds that it's gone outside the bounds of the screen, I set alive to be false. And then in here, I basically remove it from the list of objects that's in the entities list if alive is equals to false. That's basically how you do that one. Is that okay with everybody? Alrighty, let's move on and do the next bit. The next bit we might want to do is we might want to put a uh, limit on the number of bullets that you can fire per second. Now what creates the bullets? Tank creates the bullets. So in order to do this we need a very simple little bit of maths, right? And instead of me doing it, why don't you guys take five minutes by yourselves there to see if you can come up with an algorithm for deciding that we only want to fire 10 bullets per second. Just have a think about it. I will leave the update here on the screen for the tank. Because I could do this, you know, but I think it's more fun if you have a crack at it yourselves first. So what I'll do is just bring the appropriate bit of code up here. Doesn't really matter. Let it be configurable, right? So use a variable to decide how many bullets per second you want to be able to fire. At the moment it just fires. Every time the update is called, if the space key is down, it's going to check and see if there's a new bullet. Or it's going to create a new bullet, I should say. What you want to do instead is you have to check to see if some amount of time has elapsed. And only if a certain amount of time has elapsed, you allow the user to fire. So that's the bullet firing code there, right? Brian? Yeah. Uh, when you're removing the, an object from the list, and yeah. in, within a loop, yes. you make it look backwards. What's that? You should, you should make the loop backwards. So otherwise, you will skip one of the... Yeah, objects. true. You're right. Um, yeah, will it, will it skip one? Probably. So say you delete number, say there's got three elements in the list and you delete element number one. Oh, then element number one becomes... Yeah, okay. So you get three elements number one and you delete the middle one. So then three becomes two. That's so object comes to two. Hang on a sec. Oh, yeah, so... We need to... I'll draw it, right, in a minute. I think you're probably right. It doesn't really matter in this example, but you're probably right. We should. We should actually, because otherwise you're going to skip an update on one of them.
If you don't know what, you should ask the person you're sitting beside. Do they know? And then work together. Huh? But that's okay. Work on it together. It's not a hard problem. And when you see the solution, it's logical and obvious. You basically decide, right, I'll help you, right? Just say, get your head around it. So looking at that there, okay, it's always going to fire whenever you press the space key. What you want to do instead, right, is you want to basically, first of all, you say, if you're going to fire, uh, if you're only going to fire with some five bullets per second, then you need to make sure at least the first of the second Absolutely, that's exactly right. So the first thing you need to do is decide um, how much time has always well, okay. The first thing you need to do is decide how much time needs to be. So I would make that speed. Um, you know, and add calculation. And it's going to be calculated based on, um, you know, if you want to fire five bullets a second, then how much time needs to be. And then you have another variable called time And that tells you how much time has elapsed since the last time this method was called. You need to actually allow that to grow. Not just how much time since the, uh, the method was last called, but how much time since you last used it. So you need another variable before that. And then you basically add time delta to that variable. So that each time that thing's going to grow, so you're keeping, you're keeping track of the cumulative time. And then you check to see if that's greater than the time that needs to last. If it's greater than then you can then fire and try to reset how it's going to be. Uh, like I've once from yesterday and this one, they don't get them. No problem. I'm just looking at this. Most of that is we did, yeah, but most of it's there. So we put it up. I mean, I have to start with those. There's no point sitting by yourself. Thank you.